Hey, welcome back. If you watch my channel before, you know that I design pretty much everything I build in CAD nowadays. And I'd say it's actually my most important tool, even before the physical tools in the shop here, because a lot of these projects would just not be possible without lots of planning. That being said, it can be very time consuming to create CAD models, especially if you want to put a complex real life object into your drawing for reference or to 3D print something. So it would be incredibly useful to have the ability to do that quickly and easily and that's what today's video is going to be about. We're going to take a look at the new Trackit from Revopoint which is their most advanced 3D scanner so far and has so many features that I can't possibly show all of them in one video but I will be showing you how 3D scanning works in general, why this scanner is different from the ones you might have tried so far and why this is such a useful tool for designing and producing parts. So let's take a look at what's inside these boxes and then we're going to show you how to set it up and we'll do some scans to see how well it works. The first thing that surprised me besides the size of the boxes is just that from the packaging alone you can tell immediately that this is not just a toy for hobbyists but actually feels like a professional device. The track it doesn't just come in a cardboard box but rather everything is contained in these two huge very sturdy flight cases that even have extendable handles and wheels so you can move them around as a trolley. In the first box we mostly find various accessories like cables and some calibration tools on top and then further inside we can find the actual scanner unit. This looks a bit different than the usual scanners you might have seen before with the scanner itself being surrounded by this carbon fiber cage that is covered in marker points. That's also exactly what makes the track it so special because it uses a very advanced tracking system that is usually only found in much more expensive professional models. So let me explain what I mean by that. Most scanners in the consumer or even in the semi-professional market rely on what's called markers on the object you want to scan and those serve as reference points which allow the scanner to figure out where it is located in space in relation to the object. This is crucial to enable it to synchronize the data it's capturing with the data that's already been scanned and this process is called tracking. While the sensors that capture the shape are pretty good nowadays, even on the cheaper scanners, the tracking is usually their main downfall and dealing with tracking loss is basically a constant struggle for the user and can make scanning things very tedious. And needless to say, placing all these markers on every object you want to scan and then removing them afterwards is also just annoying and time consuming. So the track it solves all these issues by not requiring any markers at all and the reason why that works is inside of the second box. The device in here is called the tracker and it's basically an additional sensor with two cameras that you set up to overlook the general area you're scanning in. Instead of the scanner tracking the object, the tracker will then actually track the scanner and communicate its position so they've basically distributed the scanning and tracking to two separate devices. The huge benefit of this system is that it not only allows you to scan without any markers on the object but it also results in much much better tracking performance overall which is why this solution is usually the standard on professional scanners that can easily cost 10 times as much. Besides those two main units most of the other stuff in here is used for another very cool feature of the system which is the automatic calibration. To show you how that works I'm just quickly going to set up the tracker unit. This is the main tripod for the tracker and on top of that we're going to install the tracker gimbal and then the tracker itself. Then we just got to connect a bunch of cables. Everything is USB-C on this and as you can see they thought of everything because the connectors actually screw in so they can't fall out. The blue cable connects everything to your PC, the black cable connects to the scanner and then the yellow ones are just used for calibration and can technically be removed when you're done with that. On most other scanners calibration is done manually by the user by moving or positioning certain reference objects like this calibration pole. But Revelpoint chose to both make this process more convenient and also take human error out of the equation by making this process almost completely automated. So instead of the user moving this calibration pole, it's done by the gimbal and really all you have to do during the whole process is just follow the very simple instructions that the software gives you. After calibrating the tracker, the same thing is done for the scanner or rather the two of them in conjunction and now we are ready to put the tracker to use. I'm just going to show you a basic scan for a quick first impression. We're going to go into a bit more detail with the next one, so for my first test I more or less picked a random object that seemed suitable. In this case it's my impact drill because it has the kind of shape that would be pretty time consuming to recreate by hand. I feel like 3D scanning is kind of like 3D printing in the sense that they're both relatively new technologies, at least in the consumer market, and that means you have to manage your expectations somewhat. 
With both of these you have to be aware of the strengths and limitations of the technology and they both require some amount of practical experience and knowledge to actually get the most out of them. That being said, this was the very first scan I did with this device with no preparation, no markers, no scanning spray, no special settings. I basically just pointed the scanner at it and went for it. And I was really impressed with how well this works compared to every other scanner I've tried so far because the model that I got out of this was basically perfect. For the next one I want to explain the process in a bit more detail and for this one I decided to scan my bench vise here. This vise is kind of the star of the channel at this point because I made a lot of mods and additions for it like the speed handle, the base it's sitting on or the custom magnetic draws. Since I love this vise so much I will probably keep improving it and I figured it would be useful to have a model of it in the future and it's also a good test for the scanner because it's pretty dark but also has bright metallic surfaces which is something that many scanners tend to struggle with. So first thing we're going to do is just set up the tracker in a position where it can see the scanning area. You can scan anywhere within a range of about 1.5 to 4 meters and it makes sense to put it in a position where you have the least chance of blocking the view of the tracker with your body because that's going to obviously interfere with the tracking. The main thing you want to set up in the scanning software beforehand is the point distance which is basically the resolution of the scan and this depends on the size of the object and how much detail you need and then you just point the scanner at it and start the scan. You can see how it's now capturing the data here. The areas turn from orange to green to show you which areas have been sufficiently captured and where your point cloud is still lacking data. Then the bar on the right shows you the optimal scanning distance. It's not a super big deal if you're off by a bit here and it's basically impossible to keep it at the perfect distance at all times. And that's one of those things you get better at with some practice over time. I'm showing you this entire scan without any cuts just to drive home that it really does work as well as it looks here. You can see the tracking is extremely reliable and I've never once encountered the issue of having overlapping scanning data after the occasional tracking loss. Tracking loss can still happen with this system, but it really only does if the tracker can't see enough of the markers on the scanner. This generally happens when either your body is partially or completely blocking the line of sight, or if the scanner is hidden behind the object. The important thing is that even if this does happen and you lose tracking for a few seconds, it's no big deal, because the tracker is very good at immediately and precisely finding its position again as soon as the scanner gets back into view. So even walking in front of the tracker in the middle of a scan isn't actually going to mess up your scan. It just quickly recovers once it can see the scanner again. Another thing that's very convenient is that you can pause the scan at any time and then resume and still get perfect tracking. So you can always hit pause and put down the scanner and then go to the PC to look at the point cloud and see which areas might still need some work. In this case the scan already looks pretty good except for some of the usual culprits like overhangs and tight gaps. For example, the moving draw has quite a big gap here with no data, so I can simply continue the scan now and capture some of those missing parts. As you can see, there's still a few spotty areas here and there, but those are fairly small and the Riverpoint software is really good at filling those small holes nowadays. So I don't have to bother trying to get every tiny bit covered, because we can fix most of that when we refine the model. I'm pretty happy with how the point cloud looks at this point, so I'm going to stop the scan and hit complete, and now we're going to start the refinement process. The first step of that is running the fusion command, which fuses the point cloud together, and this also gets rid of some of the scanning noise or floating points. These can look a bit concerning during the scanning, but they're completely normal, and as you can see, after fusion it already looks a lot more clean. The next step is to start cutting away the bits I don't want. So in this case we have part of the whirling table and the base in the scan and I'm just going to remove those which is quite easy with the various selection tools you can pick from. After that I'm now going to run the mesh command which turns the point cloud into an actual triangle mesh that can be used in other 3D applications. In the meshing stage you can once again choose a resolution, so it's up to you if you want a highly detailed model that's also going to result in a large file size, or if you're fine with less detail and a smaller model. Probably the most important step for most scans is going to be the hole detection. This is one of the features that I noticed has gotten a lot better since the last time I used this software. 
The hole detection is really fast and reliable now and it shows me any spots where the mesh isn't closed. I can then choose which ones I want to close. In this case I'm going to select all of them and as you can see it's doing a really good job approximating how to fill in even large areas as long as the shape isn't too complex. With that we can now export the model and I decided to just load it into Fusion to show you what it looks like with a nice shader on it, which really brings out just how much surface detail was captured. And this isn't even the highest resolution the scanner can do. I think it's a great result and just for reference I spent only 35 minutes on this entire scan from start to finish. I just want to give you one more example of a practical application now. This is the bandsaw that I used in pretty much all of my videos and like most tools I've had for a while this has gotten a lot of mods over the years. But there's one idea that's always been floating around in my head that I never really got around to planning because it would require modeling at least half this saw and CAD and I figured it would just take too much time. So even though this saw is easily the best bang for your buck tool I ever bought, the biggest downside of these cheaper versions is that when you want to do a miter cut, you have to use this weird setup where you're actually changing the angle of the vice jaws and putting the workpiece in at an angle. This makes miter cuts kind of awkward and has a bunch of disadvantages, which is why on more expensive models the upper portion of the saw is mounted on a rotating platform instead. So the idea I've had is to get rid of the base and just use the top part of the saw and mount that to a custom machined plate that does the same thing. I could then even install the whole thing on my welding table somehow, which would enable me to use different vices and utilize the saw in other ways it was never intended for. So to figure out the overall geometry and all the necessary clearances, I want to scan the top half of the saw, which requires me to take it apart to some extent, so I can actually get a good look all around. I'm also removing the motor for this, partly because it's blocking the view in this area, but also because another plan I had was to convert this saw to direct drive and get rid of the pulley system, which is another reason why I want to scan it. Now that I removed the part I want to scan, there's a few different ways of going about this, because this has a shape that's gonna make it pretty tricky to get everything in one scan. I could prop it up like this and try to scan both sides at the same time, but there's actually a few better solutions for that. One thing the track it supports is called multi-position scanning, where it actually allows you to move the scanned object or even the tracker during the scan, which is pretty impressive, although it does require you to put a few markers on it. This is usually used for very large objects and allows you to even scan entire cars, but for the bandsaw I figured I'd go with a different solution, which is to do multiple separate scans and merging them together. So I propped it up on a piece of wood so that I can scan the top side first, and once again the scanning itself went very smooth here. One thing that can be slightly difficult to deal with with this system is that you do have to be able to at least somewhat watch your computer screen as you're scanning to see what's going on. So depending on your PC setup this can get a little bit awkward if your computer is not a laptop, in which case you'd want to set things up so your screen is not too far away or behind you. You do also need a pretty powerful computer to run this, so that's also something you might want to keep in mind. Rebel Point also makes a handheld scanner that's completely independent of a computer or any cables, but that obviously can deliver the same results, so at the point where this tech is at right now, you kind of have to choose between portability and performance. With the first side scanned, I can now just flip the whole thing over and scan the other side in a separate scan. Coming back to what I said earlier about managing expectations, there's quite a few areas here that are basically impossible for any scanner to capture because it's not an x-ray machine, so it's not going to be able to see what's underneath those pulleys for example, but it's also not relevant. The scans you make with these kinds of devices rarely need to be perfect or complete down to the last corner, and it makes more sense to just concentrate on what you actually need the scan for than trying to capture everything 100%. That being said, if you really needed a perfect model of this, you could still get that, but it would require disassembling things further and scanning the individual parts. Now that I have my two halves ready and fused, I'm just going to cut away the bits I don't want again, and then we can run the merge command, which also has gotten really good in this software. The automatic alignment feature figures out by itself how to put these scans together so they match perfectly, and two scans is enough in this case to get a pretty complete model, but depending on the complexity of your part you can merge together even more scans if you need to. After it's merged, I'm just gonna run through the refinement process again, and here's what I ended up with. 
All I need to do now is import this into Fusion and then I can start to actually design a whole construction around the scan and be sure that everything's going to fit when I'm done. Again, this whole scan took me less than an hour and I'm not sure how long it would take me to build this in CAD manually, but I most likely wouldn't even finish writing down the basic measurements within that time. To sum everything up, I'm really impressed with this scanner. I would almost consider this the 3D scanning equivalent of the Bamboo Lab X1, because for me and many others that was the first time 3D printing felt like it finally just works reliably and hassle-free, and I had the same feeling with the Trackit. Of course neither of those are 100% perfect, but using the Trackit just feels like you're using a tool that does what you expect it to and you can depend on rather than something you have to fight with. The one major downside I see with a system like this is you have quite a few cables laying around, you're always going to be tethered to a PC, and it does require a little bit of setup, but I think those things are easily offset by the scanning performance. I could imagine that the next step here might be to try and make a system like this completely wireless, so I'm excited to follow the rapid development of this technology in the future. While this obviously works great for hobbyists, I'd consider the scanner to be in the semi-pro or even professional field, and so does Revopoint, because they actually intended this to also be used in industrial applications like robotic scanning. While the price might seem steep at first, that's only until you realize what similar tracking scanners cost, because this is the cheapest scanner that utilizes this type of tracking today, so it's important to put that in perspective. There's a link in the description where you can get the track it on Kickstarter for 38% off at the point of releasing this video, so head on over there if you're interested. If you're still here, I hope this video was helpful for some of you. And don't worry, I won't turn this into a review channel. Next time I'm actually going to be back with another cargo bike build, but sponsors like Revopoint actually make this channel possible, so if you want to support me, you can just support my sponsors. And I promise I'm only ever going to do videos like this if I think the product is actually interesting to you guys and something that I would use myself. So thanks for watching and see you next time.